So a little while back I did a questions and answers video because I do get a lot of questions in YouTube comments, people reach out, they call, text, or email, and sometimes people have the same questions. But in that last Q&A video, I asked you to ask your questions in the comments down below, and we're gonna answer those now. I'm Sam and thanks for coming by the Living in Tampa channel where we make videos about the Tampa area. So if you're interested in moving here, visiting here, anything like that, maybe you're just curious what Tampa's like, we make videos for you. We are also a team of realtors, so if you do have real estate specific questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our phone number and email are right there on the screen and in the description down below. We would love to hear from you. So I've got 10 questions to answer for you today, and we recently went through all of our YouTube comments and documented all the questions. So I've been reviewing those and kind of grouping them together. So I'm gonna start by answering some kind of market questions, like what the real estate market in Tampa is like. And then I'll answer the, some of the questions that came through in the comments on the last Q&A video. So the first question here, do housing prices shift seasonally? This is a really good question. And I've been asked this question a lot of times. The answer is pretty much no. So kind of the busy season in Florida is the winter. A lot of people are visiting. A lot of people are testing out the area. That's when we have a lot more traffic from outside states, especially cold Northern states and hotel prices are higher, Airbnbs are more expensive, everything is more expensive during that time. So there is traffic during that time, people do move during that time. And then in the summer, people move while their kids are out of school. So it's busy at different times for different reasons. It is a little bit more competitive in the summer because people have a little bit more of a crunch time where they have to move. But overall, the demand is pretty steady throughout with competition ticking up a little bit during the summer. And keep in mind, I'm really reflecting on the last two years since I've been here and that has been in the midst of a pandemic as well. Okay, next question. Is there a price point where the competition drops off? Also a very good question and something that I end up communicating to people very often. There are kind of some price points and six months ago, I would have said that price point is about 500,000. But since then, we've seen a big swath of buyers from that 500,000 to 1 million range. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily more competitive, but people were buying in that range way more than they were before. So the way I prefer to answer this question, let's talk about some specifics. So we'll say with a three bedroom house, where does the competition drop off? With a three bedroom house, it drops off around 500,000. With a four bedroom house, it drops off around 600,000. And anything over 400,000 is less competitive, but it still is competitive. It's still often going for over asking price. But based on my team's experience right now, things are not going as high over asking price. We're still kind of softening and we're waiving some contingencies but we're not really going as high. And we always negotiate hard after the inspection. There hasn't been one scenario where we haven't gotten our buyer something back after the inspection, whether that's just some concessions or some repairs. So I know that was kind of a vague answer about competition dropping off, and it's really just kind of depends. But if you give us a call and talk about your specific scenario, we can identify that zone a little bit more for you. Okay, next question. Are certain loan types not being considered right now, like FHA or VA, or even low down payment conventional loans? Because sometimes with a conventional loan, you can do a down payment as low as 3%. 5% is the more common bottom of that conventional loan down payment. But yes, in the MLS, so the MLS is the multiple listing service where the brokers put their listings up for sale, and they do specify some things on there that only realtors can see on the back end. And one of those things is financing available. So they, in that question, they're answering what kind of financing options are they considering? It is not uncommon for them to just say cash and conventional. And there are a lot of reasons they might do that. In a very competitive market, it just makes sense for a lot of sellers to eliminate some of that, usually because there's something on the house that won't pass if it is a VA or FHA. There are certain things that just cannot be out of order, cannot be in need of repair with those kind of loan products. And it's, it's worth talking to a lender about that. I'm not a lender. I do not wanna offer financial advice. I do have an amazing lender that I partner with and I would love to connect you with him. And 
zero pressure on that. Like I recommend him as a partner because I know he's not going to be pushy with people. I know if something is better for you, he's gonna recommend you go do that thing. Okay, next question. How long does the purchase process take? I've realized that Florida is actually a little bit faster on this right now in April, 2022 than other states. And my lender is also really fast at this. It's been at least a year since we've had to extend a closing past 30 days because of something going on with the lender and the underwriting process. We've been able to get everything within 30 days for the past year. I don't see that extending really at all. Appraisers are pretty caught up. Inspectors are very fast right now. And my lender is, their underwriting process is all internal. So it, it just happens a little smoother and faster. Whenever you go with a bigger lender, like a more high marketing budget lender, like Quicken or Better, or even Chase Bank, some of those, some of their processes are just a little bit slower. Okay, now homestead exemption. Homestead exemption is something in Florida as part of the Save Our Homes law that was passed years ago. What this does is it puts a cap on the growth of your property tax if this property is your primary residence. So if it's a vacation home, a second home, an investment property, you cannot claim a homestead exemption on it. So the way this process works is you buy a house, and then at the beginning of the following year, I think it has to be filed by like April or something, you file this paperwork saying, this is my homestead and I want a homestead exemption. Our property taxes are paid in arrear, so that's like at the end of the year. So you're paying your lender, your property taxes, and then at the end of the year, they're paying the county. So when you claim your homestead exemption, it allows you to take some of the assessed value off. So on a $300,000 house, like, like my home, I was able to take $50,000 off the assessed value for the county. And that doesn't apply to all like the local school taxes and things like that. It applies to like the bigger county taxes. But then the real benefit to this homestead exemption, in my opinion, is it limits the assessed growth of the property. So say, my house is a great example. In one year, it increased 33% in value. But my assessed value, the value they use for my property taxes can only go up by 3%. So if, if even if your home value climbs really quickly, your property taxes are can only climb 3% per year. And that is really what makes the homestead exemption special. And other states have things like this that's not uncommon but that is how it works here in Florida. So this is a question that I was asked on a call the other day with Michelle, and she asked about homeowner's insurance. How much of it is combined? How much of it is separated? So when you talk, when you think about homeowner's insurance, it's kind of like hazard insurance. That's your basic, you know, fire, wind, water. Flood or storm water are very different things than like your wa hot water tank breaking and flooding your floors. So water coming in through your roof, water coming in from your plumbing, is different than rising water from a storm. The insurer most typically down here is citizens. They're pretty much the only insurer writing policies in this area right now. They are gonna assess the risk of your property. Like my house, for example, I'm in a flood zone. I have threat of hurricane damage. So my, they're charging me quite a bit for like wind insurance, for things like that to compensate for a potential claim. I also have flood insurance. My flood insurance is provided by FEMA and I still pay it all together. I pay all of those things as part of my mortgage payment. And you know, with your mortgage payment, you're paying principal interest, taxes and insurance all together. And then your lender is collecting your taxes and insurance month by month and then they're paying those bills for you. Okay, the next question is, what about coming from another country and buying? This happens a lot. A lot of Canadians have been moving down here in the midst of the pandemic and it is complicated to buy. There are lenders that go bo both ways. Mine would be a great resource to connect with and understand the process. They may refer you out to someone else though that can solve the problem a little better. But lenders are creative and they want to loan you money because that's how they make money. So don't give up on it. It'd be worth connecting with a few different lenders and seeing who can solve that problem for you. Okay, so those are just some common questions I've been getting repeatedly about buying in Florida, about the market in Florida. But now let's run through some questions that were in the YouTube comments of the last Q&A video. The first one is about Fishhawk. Asking me to share about Fishhawk, 
they some people had expressed that they struggled to find information online about this area. This area of Fishhawk is kind of a neighborhood. It's out in this unincorporated area of the Tampa area called Lithia, way out here southeast of Brandon and Riverview. I mean, it's still kind of part of the Brandon Riverview area. Fishhawk is a big master plan community. It's really nice. It's just kind of far for me to go make videos about. I do have some family that lives out there. My wife has some family that lives out there that I should connect with and understand why they chose that area. They have little kids, so they do like the schools out there. And he works for a big accounting firm and commutes to downtown on the weekdays. And that seems like a pretty reasonable commute. It also seems very common for people that live out in Fishhawk to commute into downtown because it's a little easier to access downtown from that side of the city. But I will do some more research about Fishhawk. It's actually on my list of area tours to, to make videos about. So more information will be coming. Okay, the next question is, should we live in a downtown apartment or a bigger house outside of downtown? And this question is such a personal preference. Downtown is pretty accessible from a lot of areas. Another one of the questions that I, I noticed in, in the YouTube comments on a different video was asking what is the commute like if you lived in Clearwater, Largo, St. Petersburg area to downtown during rush hour? And honestly, it's not that crazy. I mean, it's what you would expect. It's slowed down, it's a little congested, but it's not gonna take a multiple of two or three to get to downtown. It's gonna take a little bit more, you know, maybe 20% longer than if there was no traffic, but not crazy. There are a lot of areas where you can get to downtown pretty easily. Downtown is really cool. And finding an apartment in downtown would be fun. And living in, in downtown or, or South Tampa, one of these kind of cool areas would be a lot of fun. Rents are gonna be high because those areas are so small. There are areas around there that you could still easily access downtown. But really the answer to that question depends on your goals. If you want to live somewhere that's really accessible and fun, you wanna be able to walk to stuff really, really easily, then the apartment is gonna be a good option. If you do want easier access to the beach or you are okay with driving 20, 30 minutes to get to downtown, your options just open up a lot. Okay, and then the last question from the Q&A comments, what areas require flood insurance? There are flood maps, you can see them right here. I'm not gonna pretend that I understand them or know all of the details because each property is quite different. So the requirement for flood insurance comes from the lender. So my lender requires me to have flood insurance because my house is low, low, low. And I had to do like an elevation survey to prove how low it was, those kind of things. But pretty much if your floor is over 15 feet above sea level, your lender does not require you to carry a massive flood insurance policy. If you, if you have stuff lower than that, if it's a garage, you would likely have to carry flood insurance for those things, but maybe not for the whole property. And the flood zones are confusing too. So there are areas in like Wesley Chapel where you'll see flood zone AE, which typically means you have to have flood insurance. But I've also seen those cases where maybe the house is on a lake and it's just the last 10 feet of the property that is zone AE. So if you built something out there and wanted to insure it and its contents, you would have to have flood insurance. So it's a little more dynamic than you think. It's not just like west of this st street requires flood insurance. And it's also dependent on the property, the value of the property. So I've seen this go a few different ways. I've seen lenders require you to carry a policy as big as replacement value. And I've seen lenders require purchase price as the, the amount of coverage on the flood insurance policy. So that really kind of swings that a little bit. I had one client buy a, this little three bedroom house in St. Petersburg that was in a flood zone. At first it seemed like their flood insurance would be about $1,800 a year based on the replacement cost of their home. And that's how homeowner's insurance typically works. It's based on a replacement cost, but their lender required them to make it on the purchase price. And the lender in this scenario was Chase Bank and they were keeping the loan in their portfolio. They weren't selling it off. So this was kind of a unique case. So if you do purchase in a flood zone, it might be better to go with a local lender as opposed to one of the big banks that's gonna hang on to the loan. And what do I mean by hang on to the loan? Most lenders, they, 
it, package the loan, issue it, and then they sell it off to this government entity called Fannie Mae. And that just allows them to keep giving out more loans. Whether you agree with that process or not, that's how it works. All right, guys, thank you so much for sending in your questions in all the ways that you do. We're gonna continue doing Q and A's and we're actually gonna test out doing some live Q and A's. So I'll bring questions that people have already asked, but I would love to see you at those live streams asking your questions so we can dig in a little bit deeper. As always, if you do have any real estate specific questions, do not hesitate to reach out. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for coming by.